Hi, and uh, welcome to this uh, session of Bergeron Briefs. My name is uh, Art Bergeron. Uh, as you know, if you've watched the show before, I'm an elder law attorney. I work at a firm called Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us who do various things. I do nothing but this. Uh, usually, when I'm doing this show, there's somebody sitting here or, or here, and I'm interviewing them. And so you'll excuse me if I find myself being a little nervous, because I'm, I'm not just asking questions today. I'm talking. But the reason why I'm doing that is because um, something has happened that, as an elder, you absolutely have to know about. Uh, as many of you know, as an elder law attorney, I do a lot of work with people who are either worried about getting Alzheimer's, or they have Alzheimer's, uh, or their friend of theirs, or their spouse, or their, their parent has it. Um, and for those folks, they're trying to figure out how to deal with the fact that Medicare will not pay for the treatment of Alzheimer's, and therefore they need to qualify for Mass Health, which is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. Um, well, there are uh, aspects of the governor's budget, Governor Baker's budget, which was proposed last month and which will get acted upon one way or the other, um, uh, probably in June or July of this year, that would significantly affect um, that program. And I want to talk about that a little bit um, because you need to be aware of it You need to, so that you can decide, first of all, if you need to be planning ahead in case some of these changes occur. And secondly, honestly, so that you can decide whether, whether you want to talk to your own state rep or state senator about this, because these are matters that have been proposed by the governor. Uh, something will happen by that time, and the question is um, what the Senate and the House of Representatives will ultimately decide regarding these issues. So as background, uh, the reason why so many people talk to me about these issues uh, is that Medicare uh, does not deal with Alzheimer's disease. I mean, to put it really kind of bluntly, that's the issue. Um, to give you a sense of the importance of that, when Medicare was created uh, in 1965, one of the reasons for the creation of Medicare was that so many poor people, so many old people, were going broke because they got sick. Um, in 1960, uh, a pr about 33 or 34 percent of all people in America over the age of 65 were poor. Um, it is just amazing today to think about that because, well, maybe just because I'm getting old, that doesn't seem like that long ago. That's 40, 50 years ago that over 30 percent of all people over 65 were poor. Today, that number is about 6 or 7 percent, or that percentage is about 6 or 7 percent. The major reason for that, um, in many, in the, I find from reading many studies, is, was Medicare. Uh, what Medicare did was it provided health insurance for the old. Up until that time when you were getting old if, if, and you tried to find health insurance, you simply couldn't find it. You couldn't get insured after you got over a particular age. Uh, and so if you got sick, um, you were paying for it out of pocket, which meant very quickly you were running out of money and you were going broke. Um, and so Medicare dealt with that, and they dealt with it regarding all major diseases, really, except Alzheimer's. Now, of course, the interesting thing is that back in 1965, no one had even heard of Alzheimer's, or very few people had, so it wasn't kind of considered to be a disease. Um, but even then, there was talk about dealing with the costs of uh, treating dementia. And as you know, for the issue with Alzheimer's is that, that, that the major set, set of symptoms of Alzheimer's are dementia, fail, inability to do certain things. Um, and the problem was, as far as these folks were concerned, when they looked at this back in 1965, that including covering these kind, those kinds of things was just going to cost too much money. And so when the bill was proposed uh, by Lyndon Johnson and eventually passed, uh, there wasn't that kind of coverage. As a result, Medicare will really take care of you if you're old and you get sick and you have cancer, say. It'll cover your tests and your operations and your chemo and the, everything. It'll cover everything. Uh, or if you have diabetes and it, you need operations and you need testing and you need drugs, it's Medicare, Medicare is going to cover all those things. All of that care that you're getting is considered to be skilled care and Medicare covers the cost of skilled care. On the other hand, if you have Alzheimer's disease, and therefore you, the major the, um, problem that you have, uh, the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, are really 
dementia symptoms, lack of memory, lack of ability to do some basic skills that are related to memory, like dress yourself or take a shower safely or eat after, after you've, had to, you've had Alzheimer's for a while. There are a number of these skills for which you may need somebody to help you. Uh, typically a home, what are often called home care workers or, or CNAs, there are people who, would, who, would, who can help you. Um, the problem is that those folks are not considered to be giving a skilled service when they're making you better or helping you deal with those dementia symptoms and therefore Medicare doesn't cover them. That's the reason why, for example, uh, Medicare will not cover more than 100 days of nursing home care in a row and in that case will only cover those days if the nursing home care follows a stay of at least three days at a hospital. For Medicare purposes, you need to be in the nursing home because you were sick and therefore you had a hospital stay and you're getting better and while you're getting better you need these skilled services, the, the nurse, services of a nurse, physical therapist, occupational therapist and because you need them a lot uh, then, then as soon as it's demonstrated that you need them pretty much on a daily basis then Medicare will pay for nursing home stays but not more than 100 days. It's assumed that after 100 days you're not getting better uh, and therefore you're on your own unless you qualify for Mass Health. That's where Mass Health comes in. Now, Mass Health is simply the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. What is the difference between Medicaid and Medicare? Well, Medicare, as I had mentioned, is health care for the old. Medicaid is health care for the poor. In order to qualify for Medicaid, you need to demonstrate that you meet certain criteria to show that you are poor. Now, the reason why you hear the term mass health is that Medicaid, as opposed to Medicare, um, has variations to it depending on what state you live in. Medicare is a national program, all nationally funded, so there are national regulations. Medicaid involves 50 separate contracts, one with each state, because the federal government pays a piece of the bill for Medicaid and the state pays the rest. In Massachusetts, that's why Medicaid is called something else. Here it's called Mass Health. So whenever I'm talking about the Mass Health program, I'm referring to the Massachusetts version of Medicaid. Now, uh, in order to qualify for Mass Health, uh, you need to demonstrate uh, that you have very little in assets, actually less than $2,000 in countable assets. Um, if you're qualifying either for long-term care services uh, or for services in the home through a program called the Frail Elder Waiver, which are designed to keep you at home even though you'd be otherwise eligible for mass health. So you have to show you have very little in assets. Uh, however, uh, if you are married, have a spouse who is still living with you at home or if you've gone to a nursing home if that spouse is still back at home, the spouse at home is allowed to have a lot of other assets. Among other things, the spouse at home is allowed to have the home itself. Um, and the spouse is allowed, at home is allowed to have, uh, to actually have funds, to have uh, cash or cash equivalent assets of up to $119,220. So there are various assets that the spouse at home can have. Uh, so one of the, the, the common pieces of advice that I would give to, to, a, to a family if there were one spouse that were going to a nursing home uh, and they had assets that were typically owned by the two of them in joint names, is I'd say to the two spouses, transfer all assets to the spouse in the community. That's what it's referred to, the spouse who is still at home, right? And then you can qualify the spouse who is in the nursing home for mass health. Now, um, when that spouse in the nursing home dies, mass health has a claim today against any of the assets that were owned by that spouse that was in the nursing home at the time of death. But of course, in this situation, that amount of assets would have been very low because all of the assets would have been sh shifted to the spouse at home. Um, but even if, the sp in that case, the, the spouses had decided that they were going to keep their house in their joint names while one spouse in the nursing home qualified for Mass Health, Mass Health would have qualified that person in the nursing home because that house would not have been a countable asset since, since the spouse at the nursing home could theoretically have gone back home. And when that spouse died, if that asset was joined, owned jointly by the spouse in the nursing home and the spouse at home, the asset would have been solely owned by the spouse at home. 
and therefore Mass Health, which ha would have a claim against the assets of the spouse that had been on Mass Health, to repay Mass Health for any bills that had been paid, would no longer have any claims. Well, that relates to uh, a part of what is being proposed under Governor Baker's budget. Governor Baker's budget um, uh, has certainly a whole bunch of sections dealing with money that, that the governor wants appropriated for this program or for that program or for this agency or for that agency. But in addition, the budget contains certain outside sections. What are outside sections? Well, there are sections uh, which have been regularly proposed along with budgets by governors for as long as I can remember, which is a relatively long time, um, which have a fiscal implication. They have an implication that might affect the amount of money that the governor needs through his budget. So in this case, uh, the governor is proposing a budget with a whole bunch of requests for money, but also a number of outside sections, which he is saying will change the amount of money either that the government is collecting or that the government is spending through various programs uh, so as to affect that budget. So in this case, one of those outside sections is directly targeted at trying to increase the amount of money that can get collected by MassHealth after a person who is on MassHealth has died. It's called outside section 11. That's where all of these pieces regarding MassHealth are collected up, the governor's budget outside section 11. I'm talking to you about two of those sections today. One of them, as I mentioned, affects the situation where one spouse was in the nursing home and died and owned a home together with the spouse who was outside of the nursing home. They owned it jointly, as they probably had for their whole lives. And under current law, if the spouse in the nursing home still owned that house jointly with his or her spouse and then died, the spouse at home would become the sole owner of the house, and that would be that. Under the proposed uh, a part of, uh, of uh, outside Section 11, however, uh, Governor Baker proposes to expand the rights of mass health to recovery. And one of the ways that they're expanding that is by saying that if the person who died, having been on mass health, owned any interest in property, even if it was an interest that was not going to go through that person's probate estate, mass health would be entitled to collect money against that interest in the property. The two most common places where that will happen are first in the situation that I just gave you, where there is a house that is owned by the two spouses. One spouse dies, the other spouse become the owner, becomes the owner of the house. At that point, Mass Health would have a claim against that house, even though the surviving spouse was living in it. And the value of that claim would be equal to what would have been considered to be the value of the interest of the spouse who died at the moment of that spouse's death. So if the spouse in the nursing home um, um, owned that home only with, uh, jointly with the spouse that was at home, then that value would equal 50% of the value of the house at the date of death. There would then be a, a basically a lien or, or a right of, in mass health to collect against the spouse living at home for up to 50% of the value of the house. The, that's the first place it would have an effect. The second place, in, in, ter in terms of the folks that we deal with regularly, um, would be for folks who were single. Many people come in and they're single because typically because their spouse has died and they're trying to figure out how they can try to save some of their assets for their children or at least plan to do that in the event that they need nursing home care. And what I'll tell people in that situation is I'll say, well, you know, really the only thing that you can do in that case is you can transfer the property to somebody else, either to an individual like one or more of your children uh, or to an irrevocable trust for the benefit of that individual. Right? You can transfer that property out of your name. Um, and, but what you may want to do in order to make sure that you'll be safe at home is you may want to keep something called a life estate in that property. That is the right to live there for the rest of your life. Now as a legal matter, um, if that gets done, if, the, if my older client transfers the property to, to her children but keeps a life estate, Technically, she's giving her children what is called a remainder interest in the property, and she's keeping a life estate. In that case, when she dies, her life estate simply evaporates, leaving the children as the owners of the property. And in this case, if that older person had 
after that transfer qualified for MassHealth, then MassHealth would have had a lien on her life estate, but when she died, her life estate would have evaporated and therefore so would the lien. Um, under the governor's outside section 11, however, MassHealth in that case would still have a claim against that property, even though the property was then owned just by the children, up to the value of that life estate at the moment that that senior died. Now, the reason why both of these situations are really important as far as folks are, you folks may be concerned is that even if you've already done this kind of planning, so even if you have a life estate that you're holding right now because many years ago you transferred away the remainder interest to your children, or even if you're figuring, well, your home was always going to be safe in the event that you needed uh, to qualify for mass health because you own the property jointly with rights of survivorship, in either of those cases under outside section 11, if you apply for Mass Health after a particular date, which in the bill is a date in July of this year, July of 2016, if that occurs, then regardless of what the status of your title or of what any of the planning that you did prior to that, if you then go into to, uh, if you then qualify for Mass Health and Mass Health provides you with benefits and you die as an owner of that kind of interest in your property, Mass Health will have a claim against that property. That's a huge shift from past mass health policy, and it's something where nobody is going to be grandfathered. Nobody is going to be grandfathered. So to the extent that you need to be dealing with any of these issues, you, may, you need to be aware of this legislation if you want to make sure that your property is going to be protected in the future. Now I want to go to a, a separate section of outside section 11, which has, it could have even more far-reaching implications. Right now, um, if you die as a, in a, as a resident of a nursing home and, 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 and MassHealth has been paying for some of your bills, if you die, um, then MassHealth has a claim. MassHealth has a claim right now only against your probate assets. Under that section I just described of outside Section 11, MassHealth would also have a claim against any jointly held property that you have. But other than that, MassHealth would have no claim against the assets of your spouse. Well, under uh, this other section of outside section, this other part of outside section 11, Mass Health will have a claim against the probate assets of your spouse after you have died and after your spouse has died. No matter how long after your death your spouse has died, no matter whether your spouse remarried, no matter what your spouse's situation is. So there will be this kind of lingering possibility going for years into the future that Whatever assets your spouse your, own, dies owning, MassHealth will have a claim against those assets. So as you can see, these are dramatic changes to the way in which this piece of the MassHealth law has worked. Um, it is a, by the way, these are changes, at least some of these are changes that were actually proposed and passed once before around I'm so old, I actually remember when this happened. It was around 2003, if I recall, right around, right around there. Um, and then MassHealth started implementing these sections. And the uproar was so great that, that folks started calling their legislators. The legislature immediately passed a, uh, a bill imposing a moratorium on dealing with this and eventually repealed the section that they had passed. Unfortunately, that's a very cumbersome process. And as it happened in that particular case, when they voted to repeal this section, the new governor at that time, Mitt Romney, vetoed the repeal, and therefore the legislature had to come back and, and, and gather up enough votes, which they eventually did, to override the governor's veto of the repeal. So if these sections, uh, if these outside sections get passed and these changes to recovery become law, it may be extremely difficult to get any of this undone. So you're probably going to have to be planning around it for at least the next several years. So to summarize, um, right now there is, there, is, there is legislation, a section of the governor's budget, uh, which would, if passed, significantly increase the likelihood that mass health will be able to recover assets from your estate or from your spouse's estate um, after you die if you need mass health. Um, as opposed to most legislation that gets proposed, 
uh, in that, as you've probably always or heard if you've followed legislative matters at all, legislation often gets proposed um, but doesn't get passed. Uh, or gets passed but only several years later because things get studied carefully and sent to committee, et cetera. That's not the case with this. This is the budget. The budget in some form is going to get passed and therefore something is going to happen to outside Section 11. It's either going to get passed or amended or repealed. You need to be following this issue to find out what happens to it. Uh, I would suggest that you talk to your attorney about this and you may want to talk to your state rep or your state senator about this to, tr to try to get more details. Thank you very much for listening today or for watching today. Once again, I apologize I didn't have a, my traditional guest with me, which I will have in, uh, in my next installment of Bergeron Briefs. Thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next installment.